Hello, and welcome to Life on the Autism Spectrum. I'm Keith Halperin, and this is my co-host, Will Burnick. This is our very first program, and over the next several weeks, we hope to present you people, news, and creative efforts of those on the autistic spectrum, their families, and the professionals who deal with our community. We plan to provide diverse perspectives, we invite and encourage controversy, and we work very hard not to be boring. Most importantly, we want your involvement, your stories, hopes, and dreams. We encourage you and what you've done to be on our program, whether that's in the Bay Area or around the world. Today we have two guests, Camilla Bixler. Okay, eh, wait. Sorry, but all right. All right, so we'll let's start again. Okay, all right. Okay, record, stop. ASCEND is a really unique uh, organization. We are an all-volunteer nonprofit, and our name is an acronym. It stands for Autism Asperger Spectrum Coalition for Education, Networking, and Development. Um, ASCEND is a support group, and also it's a platform for change and a platform for action. We. Uh, for the past 15 years, we have we host we've hosted monthly meetings, we um, put on conferences, we have social events, and we have uh, specific initiatives. Ascend is um, different from a lot of support groups or organizations because we have three uh, or four kind of groups of members. We have adults on the autism spectrum. We have friends and family of adults. And we also include professionals who work with autism some way and educators. And we meet together as peers. We sit down at the table together and we see how we can help one another. Um, it's, a, it's a unique model, um, but it's worked well for us. Our, our board of directors is half uh, on the autism spectrum and half um, not on the autism spectrum and we work well together. My co-chair identifies as being on the autism spectrum and I identify as being uh, NT or neurotypical, so someone that's not um, identified as being on the autism spectrum. Um, that was excellent. H Next question. How often does it send meet and where? Ascend meets uh, every month, and we meet uh, currently at the corner of 11th Street and Howard in San Francisco at the Arc of San Francisco. And we meet on Saturdays from 10 a.m. to noon. We also have social events that are on Saturdays at various times during the year. So for example, um, Autism Awareness M Month is coming up in April, and we're going to have a brunch now for us, we've sort of moved beyond awareness and we like to think of it as Autism Advantage Month or Autism Advancement Month. But we have a brunch and we celebrate being, uh, have, you know, we celebrate living on and with the autism spectrum. That was excellent. <laughs> Who can join Ascend? Well, Ascend is open really to everyone. Uh, as I mentioned before, it's for adults on the autism spectrum, uh, friends and family, uh, professionals, educators, and we also encourage people, I, we get a lot of calls or inquiries through our website, and people say, um, I don't know if I'm uh, autistic, or someone said that I might be Asperger's, and so we just say, just come, come, it's free, you're welcome to come, talk to people and see if this is your group. Is this your community? Um, do you fit in? We have family members who have a sibling on the East Coast or someone who thinks maybe their, um, maybe their dad was on the spectrum and they'd like to find out a little more about it. So we welcome all kinds of people at Ascend and you don't need a diagnosis and it's um, always free. 
How did Ascend get started? How long has it been in, in existence? Well, believe it or not, we started, this is our 15th year. We're celebrating our 15th anniversary this year. And there was a conference at San Francisco State. And I um, might want to point out that I have a, a young adult son on the spectrum. But at that time, 15 years ago, I didn't know any adults on the autism spectrum. And my son was going to be, um, you know, was a teenager at that time. And I started thinking, what's going to happen when he leaves school? We're going to fall off this social cliff. We won't know anybody. And so I went to this conference, and I was just truly amazed at the panel of adults. I thought, wow, these are people that I want to get to know. I want to be friends with these people. So, at, uh, so afterwards, we had a meeting, and we had adults on the spectrum. We had the faculty from San Francisco State. We had professionals who were attending and other parents. And we had a really fascinating breakout session. And we said, wow, this is great. We want to keep doing this. Um, we have a lot to offer each other. Uh, for example, um, so some of the people were on the spectrum were so articulate. Um, and they could express themselves. And I thought, hmm, maybe they could help me um, understand my son a little more. And so. Uh, we started meeting. We just thought, well, we'll be a support group. And then we um, decided that we wanted to become a nonprofit. And that was a very good decision. Even though we're all, all volunteer, becoming a nonprofit was a very good decision for us because it gives us um, structure and uh, makes us pay attention to things that, you know, we have to pay taxes and we have to have correct names and we have to keep minutes. And so, um, it, it really uh, helps us uh, be organized. So over the last 15 years, we've, we were thinking we've had well over a 1,000 meetings. We've had lots of social events. I mentioned the brunch. We also have a picnic, and we have a holiday party. And we've put on um, eight major conferences. Uh, I think all of them were at San Francisco State. And this last uh, conference, um, Innovation at Work, uh, we partnered with the Autism uh, Spectrum Studies Department at San Francisco State. We like to partner whenever possible. Thank you very much, Camilla. Ba based on your experience, what is autism and what is meant by the autistic spectrum? Well, autism is not um, an easy definition. There, I think Temple Grandin is the one who said, if you've met one autistic person, you've met one autistic person, meaning that um, there is no exact profile of someone on the spectrum. It's a developmental, um, in medical terms, it's a developmental disability or a developmental difference. Um, people uh, have areas of difficulty, when we think of autism, we think of areas of difficulty or areas of challenge. We think of language or processing. Um, many people have diff on the spectrum have challenges with um, language processing or auditory processing. Um, also, uh, people with autism may, may or may not have um, sensory uh, issues. So things may seem uh, much louder to them, or they may have synesthesia where their uh, senses get mixed, a color might, uh, a number might have a color. Uh, so it's, um, it's, 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 very, it's very interesting. So language and social, uh, what would we say, social, s stop it right there. <laughs> <laughs> now, Camilla. Can you tell us a little bit about what the term autistic spectrum means? Yes. Um, so autism has a wide, wide um, range. So for example, with speech and language, um, some people with autism are unable to speak, right? And they're really unable to, um, to process language. And on, as we move along the spectrum, we have some people who are uh, exceptionally gifted speakers. So um, there's a, a wide, wide range of abilities. 
Um, it could be learning disabilities, it could be uh, more significant uh, cognitive impairment, or might have somebody who is really tests out as genius. And yet they share some of the uh, kind of core traits of autism. So the um, social issues and um, language, processing speed, some of, some of those issues. When we think of people with Asperger's, uh, what used to be called Asperger's syndrome, and I know it's been um, eliminated as a diagnosis, but I notice that in society, uh, people are still continuing to use it because it seems like a useful designation. Um, those are people who tend not to have um, as many of the um, kind of profound uh, affect effects of autism um, and may uh, have some of the uh, advantages of autism, the ability to focus, um, the ability to see things in a different way. Um, so at that end of the spectrum, uh, having autism can be an advantage. And employers, some employers are starting to capitalize on this and are starting to see that um, uh, people have a, have an, uh, you know, a, a special ability at pattern recognition or an ability um, to focus and pay attention um, that can be um, a competitive advantage for a company. SAP is an example with their Autism at Work program. Now, Camilla, I understand that there's often a link between uh, people on the spectrum and a high level of technical competence and proficiency. What has been your experience on that? Yes, that's a very, uh, something that's really um, exciting now. Uh, Ascend has been working with um, the Specialist Guild, which trains people for uh, jobs in technology. Some of our members have uh, joined the Autism at Work program by SAP. Um, the ARC has a tech initiative. So um, we see that many of our members, whether it's, as I said before, the ability to recognize patterns or to focus intently or to use numbers, um, we just see that many, not all, but many of our members um, have a special gift in this area. And being autistic um, gives them an advantage. Excellent, and I'm glad to hear that that's being increasingly recognized by uh, our employer organizations. Today we have two guests, Camilla Bixler, Ascend co-chair, and James Alray, Ascend board member. And our conversation will begin with you, Will. Thank you, Keith. Camilla, can you tell us about what Ascend is today? Thank you, Keith. What is Ascend's job club? Yeah, uh, over the last few years, Ascend has developed an employment initiative. And we um, recognize that many of our members need extra help and extra support in um, getting jobs and being successful on the jobs. Uh, job interviews are often a challenge for our members. Things like, um, you know, we, in our society, we, we um, you know, we stress the importance of looking people in the eye. And, and um, you know, for uh, one of my, one of our members told me when he looks people in the eye, it's like looking into headlights. So it's very difficult for him. It may not be the same for everybody. So he has to figure out a way to be successful in a job interview. And so the job club helps people with job interviews, resume development, and um, actually looking for, um, looking for employment. And it gives people support. Lots of people um, on the spectrum have been isolated. They've been socially isolated. And so I know um, one of our members, when it comes to the meeting, says, it's such a relief to know that it isn't just me, that, um, that I'm in a group of people who get it and a group um, of people that I'm, I enjoy being with. So the job club, uh, we have a facilitator, uh, Cindy Zoller, and she has uh, been running the job club meetings. You can find more information about this on our website. And again, uh, as with all of our activities, 
uh, they're free of charge. What are activities that Ascend is planning in 2015? Well, uh, of course, we have an exciting, uh, exciting program of monthly meetings. This month, for example, we're going to be looking at um, uh, a film that contends that the Super Mario Brothers are done from an autistic perspective, and so we're going to, uh, we're going to discuss that. We also um, are going to be looking at a new watch from MIT that um, measures stress, and we're going to see if that would be um, useful for any of our um, members. And we're going to be uh, talking to filmmaker William Davenport, who has a new uh, web series uh, proposed. And he's going to be talking about that. And he's also going to be talking about this very exciting um, summer camp for teens on the spectrum that's going to be very, uh, what he says, is geek-oriented, including things like um, drones. So we have a, an exciting meeting um, just coming up on uh, February 21st at, at the ARC 11th and Howard. We'll also be continuing with our employment um, initiative. That's an ongoing program. And one of, one of the really exciting things that we're doing is right here uh, with public access television. This is new. Um, and w I was really uh, so pleased that so many of our members are really excited about this opportunity to have, have their voices heard. You know, uh, people talk a lot about autism, but we don't get to hear many people with autism um, talking about life on the spectrum. So this is a very exciting um, opportunity for all of us, I think. Thank you, Camilla. At this point in the program, in future shows, we're going to be having a little bit of public service announcements and news from the community, whether it be here in the Bay Area or around the world. So one of the things that we are looking forward for you as viewers to do is to send in your news and uh, updates so that we can get the word out. As I say, we would not be anything on this program uh, if it were not for the content, which hopefully you will be able to give to us. This is not our program, this is yours. And along those lines, Camilla will now be interviewing our board member, James Ulrey. Camilla? Just one second. OK. Um, what All questions? A right. uh, couple things. So I'd like to um, introduce James Ulrey. I kind of refer to him as Jim. And um, Jim, why don't you tell us a little bit about your history with Ascend? I uh, became aware of the Ascend meeting, as uh, it wasn't called that at the time, by participating in a in a study at uh, UCLA on October 3rd of 1999 where I had connection I had contact with uh, Tony Atwood uh, who was an internationally known uh, autism uh, Asperger syndrome uh, specialist who gave me a diagnosis of, of Asperger syndrome he said congratulations you have Asperger's um, so I found out or somebody found out about uh, the meeting at San Francisco State and I came and attended and uh, here I am. Okay, great. And why don't you tell us a little bit about your employment history? Well, my employment history started out uh, right after high school. I uh, went to the town uh, uh, where I was born and was employed by my uncle. He had a lumber yard. Uh, uh, after two weeks, he let me go for some un unexplained reason, and it's been like that ever since. Um, I later went into the Air Force and uh, Took training in uh, aircraft mechanics and was assigned to Travis Air Force Base. And uh, as time progressed, uh, I was promoted from uh, Airman 3rd uh, Class to Airman 2nd Class. And as time progressed, I noticed that other people were being promoted to Airman 1st Class and they were passing over me. I never understood that. That was uh, my first uh, uh, inkling of, of that there was something going on that I didn't know anything about. So I left the Air Force and went, went to school at Hayward State. They call it Cal State East Bay now. Um, and got a bachelor's, Bachelor of Arts degree in chemistry and then went on to, to start a master's degree 
my master de degree was and was interrupted, and I went up to Davis uh, with my then wife, who had started a PhD program, and worked in uh, in a walnut factory, and uh, was looking for work, uh, and went for an interview at the environmental toxicology department. Uh, they didn't hire me, but uh, they thought that my uh, background and and presentation was impressive, and so they invited me into a PhD program. So I worked on a PhD for uh, some number of years and then left and then uh, returned to Hayward State where I uh, had had uh, done work, uh, which was part of the, the reason that I was invited to a PhD progress, uh, program. Finished the, the master's degree and then started uh, uh, looking for work. They had uh, the career center and I went and was interviewed by a number of people and companies and didn't get hired for anything. So I had also worked as an electrician for two years and then uh, found out that uh, being colorblind was a, uh, a, a hazard to continuing in that career. And so I ended up uh, delivering pieces for 14 years. Um, during that 14 years, I was hired at Apple to work as a uh, uh, quality assurance type person. I was a lead test test, test engineer and uh, completed that and uh, three other uh, uh, sessions as a contractor and I got fired from the third one because the only thing that I could figure out was that uh, uh, my supervisor didn't like my body language. So that initiated uh, uh, a, a search for what was going on with me, which led to getting the diagnosis of, of Asperger syndrome from uh, uh, Tony Atwood. Um, to give you an idea of what it's like to be an Aspie, is that uh, the, one of the characteristics is having a flat affect, which means no facial expressions. Um, what I found out recently is that there's a professor at UCSF uh, uh, med Medical School, uh, Paul Ekman, who has studied uh, facial expressions. What he has managed to do is to map to to map one on one or one on many of the emotions that people have with the muscles in the face, which contribute to to the to the facial expressions. Okay, um, people with with flat affects are weird, so I describe myself to people. Say I have a. I'm a certified uh, person with Asperger syndrome. People with Asperger syndrome are sometimes uh, are are always uh, or most of the time considered to be weird. So by the transitive property, I'm a certified weirdo. Um, one's technical abilities and uh, experiences are often trumped by weird. So. Also. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. I was going to ask you. Recording now. I'm uh, interested, Jim. You said that uh, when uh, Tony Atwood uh, gave you the diagnosis uh, that this was, this was something new in your life, how did you feel when you got that diagnosis? Autistics don't have feelings. Mm. Do you think that's true? Um, no. So people think that, that feelings are, 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 are emotions and they're expressed express in their in their facial expressions. If you don't have a facial expression, you don't have emotions, which is not true. There right. is a, a, a physical disconnect between the emotions and the facial expressions in, in autistics. I I think this this is goes on with the with the with the autistics who are more severely impacted. Um, it works uh, by the process of microscopic reversibility. It works in the opposite direction. I've learned to smile in the last couple of years, and if you smile, then the the, the effect of your face gets gets transmitted into your brain to affect your emotions. Um, Has it been helpful to you to learn to smile? Yes. In what way? Um, people smile back. Um, okay. The thing about uh, not making eye contact. When I was a, a young child, my grandmother told me not to stare at people, which I interpret as not looking in the eyes. Autistic people co uh, commonly uh, don't look at other people's faces because they don't expect any information to be there. As, as uh, what happens in, in the neurotypical uh, person, they, they, they develop automatically the ability to interpret facial expressions. 
um, and like and so when I learned that you're supposed to look people in the eye, I learned how to do it, and then it makes me more comfortable and and them too, especially when I add a smile to it. Uh, I uh, as a consequence, I uh, reflexively uh, make eye contact and and smile at, at whoever I run across, like if I'm walking down the street and, and people smile back. Hmm. Would it have been helpful to you to have had this diagnosis when you were, um, say, in high school? Absolutely. And in, could you talk a little more about that? Um, okay. Um, people in high school, oh, it, it, it's sort of like xenophobia. If you don't have a facial expression, you're weird. And, if it, if you, and, and xenophobes will do things. For example, when I was... Uh, in uh, grade school, I was walking down the street one day, and some guy just came up and punched me. Um, I didn't understand it at the time. Now I do. It's it's, it's xenophobia, and it, and it it doesn't end when you get out of school. Uh, the the bullying uh, is continued in other forms by uh, by by the professors at the university, by uh, the people who are hiring managers for jobs by not hiring you. It's it's a it. I, I would con uh, categorize that as a form of bullying. Uh, foremans in jobs and uh, uh, law enforcement officers will, will do that. Um, one thing, because I know you, I know that um, you are still continuing to pursue employment. What areas are you uh, looking at now? Well. In the, in the last semester, I went out to, to Diablo Valley College, and uh, uh, I was trying to get into a Dreamweaver class because uh, I would use it to uh, try and get a job writing web pages. Uh, by the time I had uh, uh, jumped through the, through the hoops to get financial aid and such, uh, uh, the class was closed. And also, the class was closed for me uh, this semester as well. But when I didn't have that class, I'd gone to the trouble to, to get financial aid. So I uh, looked around and found out that there was a, a class called PHP and MySQL for web programming. It says, oh, this looks good. I went down to the, the professor's class and got an ad card. And he uh, interviewed me and evaluated my preparation. He said that you should take uh, my other class, uh, beginning PHP, was in the morning. So my Saturdays were, were occupied. Uh, uh, for from September 16th until uh, December 6th with this class so I had to meet a, miss a number of uh, uh, a number of the meetings so I did manage to escape the class long enough to come to the the, the annual SN conference uh, but I got two A's in the class while I had, had started that uh, I got a call from uh, uh, from Luby or Andy Axel of the specialist guild and they said come in and see if you can fit in with our group so I went down there for a couple of weeks and, and, and hung out with the people, and they said, sure, we'll take you in. So I went through the 10-week training program and uh, learned uh, to, uh, for example, write, uh, write test cases for... Camilla, can you tell us a little bit about what the term autistic spectrum means? Yes. Um, so autism has a wide, wide... Um, range. So for example, with speech and language, um, some people with autism are unable to speak, right? And they're really unable to, um, to process language. And on, as we move along the spectrum, we have some people who are uh, exceptionally gifted speakers. So um, there's a wide, wide range of abilities. Um, it could be learning disabilities, it could be uh, more significant uh, cognitive impairment, or might have somebody who is really tests out as genius. And yet they share some of the um, kind of core traits of autism. So the um, social issues and um, language, processing speed, some of some of those issues. When we think of people with Asperger's, uh, what used to be called Asperger's syndrome, and I know it's been um, eliminated as a diagnosis, but I notice that in society, uh, people are still continuing to use it because it seems like a useful designation. Um, those are people who tend not to have um, as many of the um, 
kind of profound uh, affect effects of autism um, and may uh, have some of the uh, advantages of autism, the ability to focus, um, the ability to see things in a different way. Um, so at that end of the spectrum, uh, having autism can be an advantage. And employers, some employers are starting to capitalize on this and are starting to see that um, uh, people have a, have an, uh, you know, a, a special ability at pattern recognition or an ability um, to focus and pay attention um, that can be um, a competitive advantage for a company. SAP is an example with their Autism at Work program. So Jim, you were talking about your experience uh, with the Specialist Guild. I finished up the, experi uh, the experience with Specialist Guild uh, by uh, writing test cases uh, to uh, uh, evaluate uh, a shopping cart uh, uh, website. It was opencart.org. Uh, coincidentally, when I was taking the PHP course, I was, uh, was involved in uh, writing actual uh, shopping cart software. So I observed uh, uh, the behavior of the shopping cart in the test, uh, uh, the, the uh, writing test cases uh, that uh, the the website was behaving in a particular particular way, and I remembered that I I was recognizing that uh, I can write code to make to make this things work. And so um, at the end of the course, uh, Andy told me that I. Uh, uh, was more advanced than anybody else in the class, and he was recommending that I uh, uh, apply to the specialist or to Ultra Testing, a company in New York that uh, uh, employs people on the autistic spectrum to uh, do this kind of work. So I sent them an email, and they responded and uh, positively, and um, we continued. I ended up uh, sending them a resume and writing a 250-word uh, essay on something, and so. Uh, the next step is tomorrow uh, they're going to contact me at, at 9 a.m. And, and test me for two hours. I'll be, uh, they'll send me some, something to do, which I don't know what it is yet, and I'll, be, and I'll work on it for two hours. It's a, a process of the, of the recruitment process. Uh, I'm looking forward to this and would also be looking forward to becoming employed something well, that has been sparse in my history. Well, we wish you well with that, and I admire your determination. Thank you. And th thank you, James. Thank you, Camilla. Well, that's all for today. If you'd like to contact us, uh, either about this program or contributing to future ones, the information is right there below you. Uh, for Life on the Autism Spectrum, until next week, this is Keith Halperin and Will Burnick. Thank you very much, and goodbye.